Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Randall Beer. He is Professor of Cognitive Science and Informatics at Indiana University, Bloomington. His primary research interest is in understanding how coordinated behavior arises from the dynamical interaction of an animal's nervous system, its body, and its environment. Toward this end, he works on the evolution and analysis of dynamical nervous systems for model agents, neuromechanical modeling of animals, biologically inspired robotics, and dynamical systems approaches to behavior and cognition. And today we're going to focus on topics like autopoiesis, motor behavior, the relationship between life and mind and cognition, and action, dynamical systems theory, minimally cognitive agents, evolutionary theory, and some other related topics. So Dr. Beer, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you for having me. So I would like to start our conversation today by asking you about autopoiesis. So also to give perhaps a little bit of background to what we're going to discuss here today and some other related topics. So what is autopoiesis? And perhaps tell us a little bit about the history behind its development. Sure. So autopoiesis is an answer to, to the question, uh, what is a living system? What characterizes a living system? Uh, normally, the kinds of answers that science provides to that question take two, one of two forms. Uh, either it's what I call the components answer, where you give a long list of particular biochemical components that characterize terrestrial life, or it's what I call the characteristics answer, where you give a list of characteristics like growth, reproduction, evolution, and so on that describe living systems. Um, so autopoiesis is a different way of answering the question. And it came out of work by the Chilean biologists, uh, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. And they basically proposed that uh, a living system is characterized not by its components or its characteristics, but rather by its organization. Mm -hmm. And so uh, since we're talking here about autopoietic systems, what characterizes a system like that? Yeah, so they propose two conditions uh, that a system must satisfy to be autopoietic. Mm -hmm. The first one is that... Uh, the system must be what they called self-producing, um, a little bit more, not self-reproducing, but self-producing. It's an important distinction mm -hmm. there. Um, in a little more detail, uh, self-production basically is described as the system consists of a network of processes that, as they operate, produce components whose interactions sort of regenerate and constitute the very network of, of interactions that constitutes the system. So that's self-production. The second condition is basically uh, self-distinction. It has to somehow distinguish itself from the environment. And in living cells, that's done with primarily a cell membrane. So if you have a self-producing system, part of whose production involves generating a distinction between itself and its environment, then Maturana and Varela said that constitutes an autopoietic system. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear here, since we're talking about biology, um, aut autopoiesis applies to all kinds of organisms from the uh, fr from the multicellular to the unicellular, right, or not? Uh, that, that's a very interesting and controversial question. Uh, mm -hmm. Autopoiesis was originally formulated to describe the minimal unit of life. So it was basically an abstraction of cells. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not autopoiesis strictly applies to multicellular organisms, uh, primarily because it's not clear what self-production mm -hmm. might mean in the multicellular case. There's also been a lot of discussion about whether larger systems like uh, groups of animals or even you know, uh, business organizations might be autopoietic. I think the current, the current idea is pretty much that autopoiesis is largely focused on the cellular unit. It's possible that it can also be applied to uh, multicellular animals mm -hmm. 
But Varela proposed that we, need, we ought to abstract away from the notion of autopoiesis to what he called autonomy, mm -hmm. where we have a slightly more general notion of self-production and self-distinction than the primarily chemically oriented notions that uh, operated in the original definition of autopoiesis. And can autopoiesis help us answer questions regarding the origin of life on Earth? I would say yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that you can't talk about the origins of something without having some idea of what the something is. So mm -hmm. you basically have to have some notion of what a living system is. Uh, autopoiesis provides such a notion. So at least if you buy into that proposal, you know what, what origin you're talking about. Okay. But on the other hand, autopoiesis is a very abstract notion. And any particular origin of life, say, in our history, is a very concrete notion. There are particular historical events involving particular molecules and chemical reactions, and autopoiesis doesn't operate at that level. So it's not going to tell you, it, you know, it took the origin of life occurred in this geographical location at this time. Uh, involving these particular molecular components. Mm -hmm. And so we are talking mostly about biology here, but uh, does autopoiesis also apply to cognitive systems, for example? Uh, also a very good question. So autopoiesis was actually part of a much broader program of, of thought from Maturana and Varela, uh, which Maturana originally called the biology of cognition which is basically uh, trying to answer questions about neuroscience and about cognition in a very biologically grounded way. So autopoiesis in and of itself doesn't really say anything about cognition, but as an important component in this broader biology of cognition uh, framework, it plays the role of picking out the individual whose cognition we are interested in uh, analyzing. Uh, the biology of cognition, I think we're going to talk about this later, the biology of cognition ultimately developed into what's now called the inactive approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going to get into the inactive approach later on in our conversation, but perhaps to also sort of pave the way to that, I would like to ask you now about some of the work you've done on motor behavior and some of the species you've studied there. So people uh, have traditionally focused on how a nervous system controls a body. But do you think that's good enough to understand how motor behavior is produced? Uh, so first of all, I guess I would probably remove the qualifier motor, and I'm just interested in behavior. Okay. Motor is, is the action part of it, but there's also a sensory part, and there's a sensory motor loop that, that goes around it. And it, that's important because if you take that sensory motor loop seriously, then you realize that the nervous system is only one part of that loop. Also in that loop is an organism's body and its environment. And so uh, the approach I take, which is very much uh, compatible and, and really forced by the autopoietic biology of cognition perspective, is that we should think about behavior as a property not of a nervous system, but of a brain-body environment system. The nervous system plays a very important role in that multi-component system, but the body and the environment does as well. Mm -hmm. And so here, uh, are you already hinting at something like we see in 4E cognition? Uh, yes. I mean, 4E cognition is very... Uh, much uh, a later development of this notion of brain, body, environment systems. There are some particular details in the 4E perspective that deserve some further discussion, but broadly speaking, absolutely, that's a very compatible perspective. Mm -hmm. And in the sort of brain, body, environment framework, what would you say it adds to the picture when it comes to studying and understanding uh, behavior that perhaps just focusing on the nervous system itself wouldn't uh, tell us? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing is nervous systems don't behave, right? It's only organisms that behave. And so, you know, the, in the very form of the question, it's clear that you can't just look at nervous systems. Nervous systems generate electrical activity. 
Uh, they generate, you know, chemical concentration changes across the, the space in which they exist and so on, but they don't behave. Behavior is a property only of the organism. Uh, and as I said, furthermore, behavior only makes sense in ecological context, in the context of the environment in which it operates. And so it's kind of like trying to explain uh, anything when two thirds of, of the system that you're trying to explain has been thrown away. Clearly, you can find correlates in the nervous system uh, when various kinds of behaviors take place. You can find correlates when the organism is experiencing certain kinds of sensations, but you're missing two thirds of the story as to where the behavior is actually coming from. Mm -hmm. So regarding uh, behavior, and I guess in this case, motor behavior specifically, you've done work on C. elegans. So could you start by telling us why C. elegans is a good model to studying behavior and some of the questions that are brought about uh, for, uh, looking at things from the perspective we've been talking about here? Sure. So uh, Sanorhabditis elegans, the C is short for Sanorhabditis, is a, basically a nematode worm. Um, that is one of the most studied whole organisms, um, let me say, best understood uh, whole organisms in biology. So it has less than a thousand cells in its entire body, and about a third of those are nerve cells. So it has uh, 302 in the, in the particular uh, organism version that, that is mostly focused on the hermaphrodite. And it was the first organism to have its uh, genome completely, the first animal to have its genome completely sequenced. It was the first uh, animal to have its entire developmental lineage uh, mapped out. So we know from the fertilized egg to the adult animal, every cell division that produces the final roughly a thousand cells that make up the, the adult. It was the first animal to have its connectome worked out. That is the pattern of synaptic connections between all of the neurons in, uh, in its nervous system. So it's just one of the, the most well-characterized organisms, sorry again, animals uh, in biology. And that makes it a wonderful uh, platform for looking at issues of how brains, bodies, and environments interact in the production of behavior. C. elegans also has had a lot of uh, characterization of its behaviors. Um, it's not as trivial as you might think. Um, among its behaviors, actually, uh, C. elegans can exhibit associative learning. So it can learn to associate uh, stimuli primarily with the availability of the different kinds of foods that it prefers. Mm -hmm. And I guess that this example is very interesting also because since we've already completely mapped out uh, its nervous system. I guess that in this case, it's, it would also be very informative when it comes to some of the questions regarding uh, if we should uh, focus just on the brain or also the body and the environment in this case, because I would imagine that even if we have its nervous system completely mapped out, uh, it's not enough to understand its behavior. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a great example of, of how connectomes, the, the wiring diagrams of nervous systems are necessary, but not sufficient for mm -hmm. understanding nervous systems. The big thing that's missing there is uh, the actual dynamical properties of the individual cells and of the network as a whole. It's kind of like being given the schematic for a radio, uh, and not knowing anything about how resistors or transistors or capacitors work, nor uh, any concept of frequency modulation and amplitude modulation, amplifiers, filters, and so on. You know, the wiring diagram is necessary, as I said, but it's not sufficient. There's a lot more you need to know, even if you don't buy into the idea that the body and the environment is important. Purely from a neural point of view, the connectome is not enough. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let me ask you now a little bit about locomotion in C. elegans, because as far as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there have been multiple mechanisms proposed to explain locomotion in C. elegans. Uh, 
Some of them have to do with, for example, pacemaker neurons, stretch, receptor feedback, network oscillators. So could you explain each of these? And do you think that one of them is a better model than the others to try when trying to understand uh, motor behavior in C. elegans? Sure. Um, so yes, locomotion in C. elegans is one of a family of different behaviors that people have been working on. Um, before I answer the question directly, mm -hmm. though, I have to say uh, one thing about C. elegans short, as okay. a shortcoming as a model uh, organism. And that is that uh, unlike larger organisms, it's not really possible to record uh, from the activity of individual neurons in C. elegans. Um, you might think, given that we know all this about C. elegans, why is it even a question as to how locomotion works? Don't we already know? Because its nervous system is mapped out. And the problem is that we don't have the dynamics that we talked about earlier. So uh, there are a variety of technical reasons for that. But the bottom line is there is another approach that uh, is really gaining ground, and that is optogenetic approaches. And very briefly, basically what you do in optogenetics is you because the genetics of C. elegans is so well known, you can basically insert uh, genes into its genome so that the nerve cells will express a fluorescing protein in the context of calcium activity, um, which basically means that in these genetically modified C. elegans worms, they'll basically, the neurons will, in a sense, light up under the appropriate laser light uh, at, when they're active. And so you can image uh, a C. elegans, often these days a freely behaving C. elegans, uh, as it you know, goes about its life, you can watch neural activity in its nervous system. It's not easy. Um, it's in fact very challenging and it's, it's very sort of cutting edge right now, but, but that's the tool that's being used to get some insight into into what's going on in the nervous system dynamics. Now, given that little uh, uh, aside, um, you asked specifically about locomotion. So mm -hmm. there are really, not just in C. elegans, but broadly in studies of animal locomotion, sort of two broadly different ways in which a locomotion system can operate. And then within those, there are subdivisions. So. Uh, the biggest division is between what are called central pattern generators and what uh, you might call sensory driven or reflexive pattern generators. So uh, a, a central pattern generator is basically like the nervous system has a clock built into it that just keeps generating some kind of a rhythmic pattern such as the locomotion pattern. And that there's a variety of ways to do that. I'll, I'll return to that in a moment. Um, Pure central pattern generators don't require any sensory feedback. They're just generating the motion. Um, reflexive or sensory driven pattern generators in contrast require feedback from the body and the environment in order to produce the, the rhythmic motion. So if for some reason the sensory input becomes unavailable, the pattern will run down and it will no longer produce the rhythmic movement. Typically in biology, uh, like almost all of these uh, dichotomies, both are usually true. So there can be some central oscillatory tendencies in neural circuits, and there are sensory feedback that modulate and shape those oscillatory tendencies. So within the central pattern generator uh, notion then, uh, a distinction is often made between pacemaker neuron-driven central pattern generators and sort of network driven central pattern generators. And the difference there is that individual nerve cells uh, are often capable of producing oscillations on their own without any connections to other nerve cells. And that's a pacemaker neuron. That's one way you can produce rhythmic uh, oscillations. A network oscillator, on the other hand, takes neurons that themselves can't individually oscillate but when you wire them up into the appropriate networks, those networks can oscillate. And once again, uh, this dichotomy is probably mostly false in that you can find uh, pattern generators in biology in which there are some oscillatory neurons involved, but also the network interactions are very, very important. And so these distinctions that are typically made in the literature um, often blur a bit when you look at any particular animal. Having said that, though, 
the, the particular trade-off between sensory versus central and pacemaker versus network can vary from animal to animal. And the question in C. elegans specifically is, you know, what mix of these things is uh, playing the, the, the most important role in C. elegans locomotion? And it's not a resolved question. There is strong evidence that sensory feedback, primarily from stretch sensors in the animal's body as it bends, uh, there's a way for the neurons to detect the stretching of the body as it bends. Um, those seem to play an important role. It also seems at least possible, given current theoretical and experimental studies, that there is some intrinsic oscillatory tendency in the uh, motor neurons that make up the, uh, the locomotion network. And different people have proposed, you know, uh, this model suggests the sensory feedback plays a stronger role, or this model suggests the central oscillations play a stronger role. There's some experimental support either way. It's very much an unresolved question at the moment, um, which I, seems resolvable, I guess, is the nice thing, is that we actually, because we have our hands on all these components in C. elegans, which is rare in animals, um, progress is being made on this question. And so do you think that studying, in this particular case, the locomotion of C. elegans, but it could be other the, the locomotion in other animals or organisms, in what ways do you think it can uh, inform our understanding of the relationship between brain, body, and environment? Yeah, excellent question. So uh, in the models of locomotion that we build, uh, Unsurprisingly, given what I've said earlier, there, there aren't they aren't just models of neural activity. We also model the specific muscle cells in the animal's body whose contraction produces the motion. Uh, that's closely related to the ways in which stretch is sensed. So that's required for getting the sense the sensory feedback. And it also turns out there's been some really interesting work that. Um, so C. elegans can locomote across a variety of different surfaces, including surfaces that are very viscous and surfaces that are very watery. Okay, And there's evidence, strong evidence, that that plays an important role as well. So if you contract a muscle, how the body moves partly depends on the body, but it also partly depends on the medium in which it's locomoting. Mm -hmm. And it's the feedback from that movement, which is then sensed by the stretch receptors and feeds back into the neural system. And so it's actually an ideal system for looking at the relative importance of all these three components, the neural activity, the body properties, and the environmental properties. So just before we move on to some other topics, at a certain point in our conversation, you mentioned connectomics. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? What these connectomics exactly? Yeah, I mean, so the connectome uh, refers to just uh, basically an atlas of all the connections between neurons in a nervous system. Mm -hmm. So connectomics is just sort of the study of the connectome of organisms. You can actually uh, describe connectomes at a variety of different levels. When I've been using it uh, in C. elegans, I mean literally a map of every synaptic connection. You can't do that in much higher animals. There's been some anatomical mapping of connections in the fruit fly and in the zebrafish. But beyond that, primarily, and actually a little bit in mouse now, um, but beyond that, when people talk about, say, human connectomes, they aren't talking about all the synaptic connections between every neuron in the human brain. What they tend to be talking about are overall projections or tracks of connections, like highways of bundles of connections from one region to another region. And sometimes they even talk much higher level than that when they talk about functional connections, where you're not even talking about actual axons connecting one neuron to another, whether it means individual ones or bundles, you're basically looking at the statistics of firing of nerve cells in the brain. And you're saying, well, it looks like this region fires in a certain way, and then this region does. So there's a strong correlation, which suggests functionally, there is a connection between the two, even if the actual synaptic uh, connections may be much more complicated than that. 
Uh, and so let me just ask you one more question, a follow up to that before sure. we get more into cognition. So uh, we're talking about C elegans here, and it's, uh, I would imagine, a relatively simple animal. If we think about uh, some higher order animals, um, do you think, uh, okay, so perhaps let me separate this into two distinct questions. So sure. There's this idea, of course, that if we have a complete map of our brain and let's add our body to it, uh, we would have a full understanding of how behavior is generated, how cognition works, etc. Uh, I mean, uh, I would imagine that in this case, you would say that's not enough, but uh, th that's one question. The other question is, uh, is, is do you think it, would, it will ever be possible for us to do that, for in higher or order animals to have a complete map of their brain, body, their nervous system as we have in C. elegans? And even if we did, to be able to understand uh, the operations there because of the complexity. Yeah, well, so to your first question, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, no, it's not going to be enough, even if you have such such a complete map of connections as we already see in C. elegans. I mean, I think that hypothesis has really pretty much been shot down. Um, if it were true, then the moment the connectome of C. elegans was uh, completed, we would be able to to understand and predict, you know, all its behaviors, and that's just not been the case at all. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to your second question, I mentioned that it's not just C. elegans, but also zebrafish and Drosophila, the fruit fly, and to some extent portions of, for example, mice. Uh, there are such mapping programs in uh, in progress. Uh, I, I tend to look at C. elegans as kind of a, a good test case because the mapping program ended in, in, I mean, it's still going on a little bit, but in 1986, I believe it was the, the connectome was published for C. elegans. So since 1986, we've had the opportunity to try to use that to make sense of the animal's uh, behavior and neural activity. Um, and so if we can't do it there, or let's put it this way, until we can do it there, it seems uh, unlikely that we're suddenly going to be able to do it in a much more complicated animal first. And so I'm very much a sort of simpler systems first kind of kind of scientist. I really think we need to, to work it out in a case where we might be able to understand it before we try to go to a more complicated situation. Um, Will we ever completely map out the uh, connectome of higher animal? I mean, there isn't even a connectome, say, of a human being. My connectome and your connectome are very, very different in their mm -hmm. details. So uh, that really is a question about might there someday be the technology to completely map out the connections of any individual human brain. And I'm not an experimentalist. It seems unlikely to me, but also techniques, uh, you know, explode. There are all kinds of interesting uh, new techniques get discovered. I think the more interesting question, though, is once we fully understand the simplest case, like C. elegans, will we find that it's even necessary to completely know the interconnections? We may discover that the, the connectome is part of the story. Some parts of it in particular are useful. Other parts maybe are details that don't really matter all that much. Until we have an understanding, we have no basis for deciding what's important and what's not important, which is another concern with trying to map the connectomes of higher organisms. You, you don't know what to map. So you just map everything. And you can do that in C. elegans. You can do it maybe in zebrafish, but it gets harder and harder to do that in higher organisms and more and more pressing to know whether or not that's even necessary. Yeah. So moving on to another topic then, um, what is the relationship between life and mind? How do you go from biology to cognition? So that's obviously a very big question. And yeah. if I had the answer to that, <laughs> I would be very happy. Um, uh, 
What I can say is that, for example, within the biology of cognition framework that Maturana and Varela put forward, they would answer that, yes, there's a very, very close relationship that basically, um, in a sense, mind is what life does. Okay, so you need to have a living system or something like a living system to have uh, mind, to have cognition. Um, that's half of the answer. The other half of the answer is that essentially all life uh, exhibits cognition in a certain sense. So we have to be a little careful with terminology here. Cognition is one of those words that means very different things to different people. Um, Maturana and Varela use the word cognition in a way I think that's very close to what we would call behavior. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's just the interactions that an organism engages in with its environment, be they very simple interactions or very, very high level complicated human interactions. They don't make a distinction in kind between those two. Whereas if you look in cognitive science, usually cognition is used in a very much more narrow sense than that. Um, typically, it's it points to the cluster of behavioral capacities that are unique to, or at least most commonly found in human beings. Okay, And when you define it that way, then you get into all these debates about animal cognition and so on. When you define it in Maturana and Varela's way, there's no cliff, there's no sharp edge from one to the other. It's just, Which is not to say that C. elegans can play a good game of chess. It's just saying that what C. elegans does is not different in kind from what we do. We just have a much deeper and richer capabilities in shaping our behavior in interacting with our environments than uh, a simpler animal like C. elegans does. Okay. So, so in this biology of cognition framework uh, that Maturana Varela put forward and that, that an action builds upon, um, yes, those two things are very, very closely related. Um, Life is the thing that behaves. And whenever you have a living system, it's of necessity embodied and embedded and therefore engaging in interactions with its environment. You can't not have behavior with a living system. And without that autonomously behaving entity that is an organism, behavior doesn't make any sense in a sense, in Maturana and Varela's perspective, at least. Okay, so I've, yeah. I've tried to answer your question within the context of a particular conceptual framework. That mm -hmm. question would be answered very differently in the context of other conceptual frameworks, where, for example, you know, in cognitive science, uh, at least in some areas of cognitive science, uh, the biology is completely irrelevant. Uh, it, the distinction that's typically made is the biology is the hardware, cognition is the software, and that kind of a distinction makes no sense in the biology of cognition framework, but in traditional cognitive science, that's a very strong distinction. And so the answer to your question depends on what conceptual framework you, you want to address it from. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, uh, of course, it's important to keep in mind in this conversation that we are tackling here things from a particular perspective in cognitive science, because there are several perspectives out there. So, and you mentioned at a certain point there that based on uh, Maturana and Varela's uh, biology of cognition uh, framework, an uh, activism uh, sort of stems or builds up from that. So, uh, what is in activism then, and how does it frame cognition? Okay, so. Um... In answering this question, I have to point out that you'd probably get a somewhat different answer from uh, an inactivist. Uh, so from my perspective, as I've said before, inactivism is just a further development of the biology of cognition framework. Um, it adds a couple of things. Uh, one is that it adds uh, phenomenology. So, so this is a tradition in philosophy uh, that uh, grants, I wouldn't say necessarily say primary, but let's say at least equal status to subjective 
experience and subjective perspectives as it does to objective perspectives that are more typical in the natural sciences. So mm -hmm. it brings in a whole body of thinking there, uh, which I don't work with at all. So I'm not going to say any more about that. But if you talk mm -hmm. to uh, sort of card carrying and activists, they would really emphasize that component. Mm -hmm. um, Inactivism also uh, takes on board Varela's abstraction of autopoiesis to autonomy. So it's it's primarily interested not in living systems per se, but rather in autonomous systems. And uh, typically identifies or uh, works with autonomy at other levels. So for example, sensory motor autonomy, uh, even social autonomy, the autonomy of sort of social units uh, as a kind of new level of cohesion that mm -hmm. can have its own autonomy and own interactions with other social units and so on. And so it really, whereas auto, whereas biogeocognition was primarily grounded in autopoiesis, although it also had a lot to say about nervous systems, um, an action sort of starts in some sense by emphasizing the sensory motor unit the uh, the multicellular agent interacting with its environment as uh, as a main focus and is also very interested in um, in how sort of meaning comes into the picture. Uh, the original biology of cognition explicitly rejected notions of meaning and purpose and things like that as as being, constructs that appear in the eye of the observer of an autopoietic system rather than play any operational role in its you know moment to moment uh, function. Uh, in action through Varela's uh, later work, uh, tr basically views such things as intrinsic properties of the system, not ascribed properties. And again, I, I'm not the best one to explain that because I, I most of my work is very much grounded in the biology of cognition framework, although with a few uh, steps towards more inactive uh, conceptions. So there's a notion of precariousness, for example, which comes out in an action that I think was very much implicit in the biology of cognition and autopoiesis, but wasn't really made explicit. Um, so I, I work with that with that concept. I also am very interested in the models that I make of uh, autopoiesis and the biology of cognition in at least flipping back and forth between what you might call the objective and the subjective perspective on the same agent and look at how those two perspectives sort of stories might relate to one another as a, a simple way to think about how to resolve the apparent tension between uh, these two perspectives without granting a priori the subjective perspective as being an intrinsic characteristic, clearly we have a subjective perspective. We can take a subjective perspective. And so it's interesting in the models to look at what that consists in, taking an objective versus a subjective perspective on these model agents I look at. Mm -hmm. So earlier uh, we mentioned at a certain point that there are different approaches, different perspectives and frameworks in cognitive science. And uh, one of them, or a group of them, I'm not sure, is usually called computational representation, uh, re computational representationalist approach. So uh, I would like to ask you if uh, that is still the dominant approach in cognitive science. And yes. if so, what would you think are its limitations? So the answer to the first question is absolutely yes. Um, the second question, I, I hate to do this, but again, it gets into terminological distinctions. So one of the problems with the notion of computation in cognitive science or the notion of representation in cognitive science is that people mean lots of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can't just talk about the computational approach or a representation 
just to give you an example, in, in a paper I wrote many years ago, I identified, I think it was five different notions of computation that are at play in cognitive science. Um, just to quickly give you an example of what I mean. So there's the notion of follow of what we do. So when I sit down to compute my taxes, I follow a step-by-step -step procedure according to certain rules uh, that takes in information, slots it into certain things, and then do the calculations and outcomes some result. Okay. So in that sense, computation is something we do and therefore something that has to be explained. Okay. Right. Computation is also uh, a body of mathematics. There's something called the formal theory of computation, which was developed in, uh, in the 30s and 40s, 1930, 1940, um, which was an attempt to mathematize the thing that we do when we compute our taxes or something like that. Okay. Then there's the technology that we're actually using to communicate right now, the actual physical computers um, as devices that are physical instantiations of the formal theory of computation. Okay, that's three so far. Then there's what you might call the computational perspective on the world, where we look at everything as computing. So uh, the you know development computes an organism. The input is the genome and the output is the organism. That's a popular way of talking. Um, you know, uh, what's going on in when, when, when we're thinking is literally computation, which is an interesting loop because the notion of computation started by what we do when we deliberately reason through a problem, spawning a body of mathematics, spawning a technology, which has now spawned a way of thinking about what it is we do when we think, right? Um, and then finally, there's what's often called the computational hypothesis in cognitive science, which is sort of, it's supposed to be a literal hypothesis, which takes that worldview. The worldview basically just says it's useful to talk about complicated things as performing computations. The, the computational hypothesis is a literal claim about cognitive systems, a, a claim about the way they must be understood. So, so that's an example, five different readings of the word computation, which are all related, but actually distinct, I would argue. And if you have a debate about someone about whether or not uh, cognition is computation, you get very confused when, for example, I make computer models of my agents. So a, uh, a computational hypothesis person, when this has happened to me, would say, but, but what you're saying is inconsistent. You're using computation in your work. Obviously, you accept the computational hypothesis. Well, not necessarily because you have to distinguish those things. And I won't go through it again, but the same thing is true of representation. People have many, many different notions of representation. There are many, many different notions of what information is and so on. So that makes it a little difficult um, to answer your question, I guess, in a definitive way. We would have to pick some particular notion. I mean, some standard issues are uh, computational approaches to thinking about uh, behavior tend to conceive of everything as an input-output system. And in contrast, the brain-body environment perspective, there is no input-output. There's an ongoing interaction between these three coupled systems. And you can arbitrarily come in and make a cut here and say the sensor readings here are the input and then make a cut at some point later in time and say the motor actions here are the output. But, but those are arbitrary. I could cut anywhere I want. The fact is the system is a recurrent unfolding system. Okay. Uh, another, and then I'll, I know this is long-winded answer. I'll give you one more example to try to answer your question in a little bit. Another criticism that's been made against uh, sort of the really strong computational representational uh, perspective is that it takes a world, you know, the world that we inhabit, which is very complicated and dynamic and, and uh, new distinctions are constantly coming into being and so on. And it tries to freeze it into a sort of logical formal structure. So if I say uh, John is a liberal, 
and I represent that in the computer with a token John and a, a relation liberal, then I've lost all the distinctions that involve John as a full-blown person and the notion of, of liberal perspective as a, you know, a multifaceted thing. So uh, I, I presumably say John is a liberal in some context, in some conversation where we might be talking about economic policies or social policies or even scientific perspectives. I might be talking about a very narrow set of John's behavior with respect to those policies and so on. But the moment you freeze that stuff into a formal representation, such further distinctions are lost. John is a liberal. Right. And so such systems tend to be very, very brittle in their operation and so on. I mean, there's lots of things that we could say. Main point is it's a very complicated discussion because you have to make careful distinctions about what people mean by these different words before you can debate their utility. Mm -hmm. And related to that, this is something we've been touching on during our conversation. But uh, in what ways is a dynamical approach to cognitive science different from a computational or representational approach? So it, not surprisingly, based on what I just said, the notion of dynamics in general and dynamical approaches in cognitive science in particular is multifaceted. In fact, the same five distinctions I made with computation can also be made with dynamics. So dynamics is a is something we observe. I mean, things change in the world. Things change in the universe, right? Uh, there is a, uh, a modeling technology, namely differential equations, uh, which is one mathematical way we can capture such change in the universe. There is a, uh, a scientific body of mathematics called dynamical systems theory, which, like the formal theory of computation, is an attempt to kind of formalize the structure that one observes uh, in the time-changing behavior of systems. And it provides various tools for analyzing such systems like attractors and bifurcations and so on. There is uh, what you might call the dynamical worldview, which basically just says, uh, if I look at the world, there's lots of static properties in the world, like uh, a cloud lies above the terrain. That's a static property, right? It's a static spatial relation. Uh, and some approaches to uh, science, like cognitive science, often focus on static properties, like John is a liberal, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but in the dynamical worldview, those are not in primary. What's primary are the dynamical relations, how things are changing over time. Um, and when you approach the world that way, then it's change that you need to explain, not, not just these static relations. And then finally, uh, a, a philosopher of mine called Tim Van Gelder proposed a literal dynamical hypothesis that was meant to be on par with the computational hypothesis that makes a literal claim about uh, a cognitive system is a dynamical system and should be understood in that way. Okay, So I tend in my work to make use of the first four notions of dynamics, but I'd have to distinguish them if we talk about any particular piece of work or argument, uh, but not the fifth one. I don't think the dynamical hypothesis as a hypothesis is any better than the computational hypothesis as a hypothesis about cognition. Because for example, I don't think there's any literal meaning to the question, uh, is a cognitive system a dynamical system? That's kind of like asking, is a planetary orbit a differential equation? Well, we mod we can model it as a differential equation. We can apply uh, the mathematics of differential equations to find its solutions and to analyze those solutions. But there's no fact of the matter. It's not a scientific question. It's just a mathematical lens that we can apply to the phenomenon. And I think dynamics and computation are also best understood as mathematical lenses that we can apply to something like cognition. And what we're interested in is what the system looks like through these different lenses and which lead ultimately to the best theory, the best understanding and explanation of the processes that we see through those lenses. Mm 
So could you just tell us a little bit about some of the historical background behind the situated embodied dynamical framework in cognitive science? And perhaps then we can also get a little bit into something that I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, that is for e cognition, embodied, mm -hmm. embedded, enacted, yeah. and extended cognition. Yeah. So interestingly, I mean these these three things. Uh, for now, uh, dynamics, embodiment, and situatedness uh, seem like they make such a good set of things. They sort of interconnect and mutually support. But historically, that wasn't really how they arose. Um, all three of them did arise, though, in about the same decade, at least in my reconstruction of the history, roughly from 1985 to 1995. Uh, they all had precursors, so they didn't come out of the out of the blue. Um, just to take one example, a cybernetician, uh, W. Ross Ashby, was talking about dynamical approaches to thinking about the brain and nervous systems back in the 40s and 50s. Okay, um, And you can find similar precursors in various areas of science and sometimes philosophy for emphasizing the role of the body and the role of the context, the, the situation. But it, it, in this 1985 to 1995 uh, window, a number of things I think were happening. One is that, so I should preface this with one comment. My training is in computer science. And so I viewed this, I came up through, the, through basically an artificial intelligence perspective uh, and only came to neuroscience and cognitive science and so on later. Okay. okay. So the, the way I'm going to tell the story is somewhat biased from that direction. Um, right. But I do think it's not all that different if you got someone who lived through it as a psychologist or as a philosopher or as a neuroscientist. So, but from my perspective, um, circa 1985, there was an increasing uh, number of people who were very concerned with the limitations of AI as it was being practiced at the time, some of which we've mentioned, like the brittleness of the systems and so on. Um, and let me start. So like I said, I could do this in many different ways, but let me start with embodiment. So uh, Rodney Brooks, a, a roboticist and AI researcher at the MIT uh, AI lab, uh, really started pushing the idea that embodiment mattered. And he was a roboticist, so he pushed it from the point of view of the kind of robots that we build from the classical traditional AI perspective just aren't cutting it in the real world, right? They, they, they aren't flexible enough. They aren't fast enough. They look nothing like even the simplest biological systems. So what we need to do is reorient our thinking in AI away from very high level, narrow capacities like natural language communication or chess playing. Uh, medical diagnosis, things like that, and focus more on what it takes to make a robot behave like an animal in the world. Okay. And that was the beginning, in a way, of this embodied notion. It really came out of robotics in AI. Mm -hmm. Situatedness, interestingly, uh, is somewhat different. So the earliest work in situatedness really came out of areas like anthropology and social psychology. So uh, the, people like Lucy Schlipfen and um, Ed Hutchins and Terry Winograd um, were all concerned. So they, they initially, at least, were very much thinking in terms of computation. But their, their beef was not that, that computation wasn't a good model of cognition. It was that computation was limited and that it tended to be isolated from the situation, the environmental context in which cognition operates. Okay. And okay. so uh, part of this came out of actually concerns about language. John Bearwise is another uh, person that, that to mention here, uh, that when you're trying to understand language, you, you really can't do it very well, divorced from a situation in which the language is occurring. Okay, mm -hmm. So there, be, there came to be an approach, uh, William Clancy is another person that comes to mind now as I go through this, there came to be an approach called situatedness or situated cognition that basically focused on not just the individual cognizing agent, but the situation, the environmental context in which it operates. And Ed Hutchins, for example, the anthropologist would do things like study how a naval vessel 
navigates. Not a navigator, but a naval vessel. And he would identify all the different people and instruments and so on that collectively interacted so as to produce a course on a naval ve vessel through, through the ocean. Okay. So that was situatedness. And finally, um, I guess there are different, so I was very personally involved in the dynamics one, a little bit in the embodied and, and even less in the situated, but my personal perspective on the dynamical uh, flowering that occurred in uh, the late 80s and early 90s was really a kind of rediscovery of Ashby and his way of thinking about things, um, reapplying it to uh, these notions. So there was a book, Mind is Motion, that was one of the first sort of treatises that pulled together a bunch of people doing work in this area. Um, and it's an interesting snapshot to see some people were working on motor behavior at the time, like me, but some people were working on language and thinking that language is not such a static, discrete structure. Language occurs in time. As we speak, I'm producing a sequence of words. As we read, we're consuming a sequence of words. And each word sets the context in, say, my brain activity for reading the subsequent word. That sounds very much like a dynamical process, not different in kind, at least, from planetary orbits and things, something that unfolds over time, right? There are people looking at perception and so on. So in a lot of different areas, people were starting to realize that, you know, we're ignoring all of the temporal information that uh, is crucial to everything in the natural world, including even things like human language. So, so you had, let's say 1990, although there's, it's not a particular point there, but let's say about 1990, uh, you had all these different strands sort of out there intersecting, but also somewhat separate across half a dozen different fields. And over the, the subsequent few years, they started to come together. Um, in my own work, uh, I, just to give you an example of how they come together for my dissertation, which I completed in 1989 and was published as a book in 1990. That's why I'm dating that time. I basically set out to try to build in simulation a complete behaving virtual animal. Okay, So I built an artificial insect had legs that could move and feet that could grasp and, and release antennae that could sense its environment, a mouth that could bite and taste and so on. Inside that virtual body was a dynamical nervous system that controlled all of those behaviors. And I placed that body in an environment containing obstacles and food sources and other insects and so on. So I was personally at that time starting to put together the notions of dynamics, embodiment, and situatedness in the context of basically trying to, to, to move away from this notion in AI of trying to model very narrow, high-level human competencies and shifting it towards trying to model complete, simpler organisms, uh, something that was also suggested uh, around, I think, 1984 uh, by Valentino Breitenberg in a very famous book called Vehicles, that he published. Um, so again, all these things were kind of in, in you know, the air, and different people picked up on them in in somewhat different ways. And how do we get from there to four E cognition? Then, yeah. So four um, E cognition. Uh, there's a little bit of inconsistency, but largely uh, talks about embedded, embodied, inactive, and extended. Mm -hmm. notions. Okay, so the embedded uh, basically refers to what I've been calling situatedness. The embodied is what we've been calling embodiment. So the first half of that is stuff we've already talked about. It just got pulled out and named in a clever way that all began with ease to, to, as, a, as a way to kind of put it out there as a unit. Mm -hmm. um, inactive and extended are a little bit different. So inactive, as we've already briefly mentioned, was basically a parallel line of work that was going on um, throughout the 80s uh, in Varela's further development of the notions of biology of a cognition 
-hmm. which was coming to incorporate notions of dynamics and embodiment and situatedness, but also, as I mentioned, notions of phenomenology and uh, meaning and teleology, purpose, and so on. Okay. Uh, so I don't view it in some sense at the same level as I do the situated and embodied components. It's in some sense a complete research program that just uh, incorporated uh, as it developed these other notions of situatedness and embodiment. Uh, also dynamics, which is not in the 4E at all because dynamics begins with a D, but I suppose people assume that's kind of incorporated into an action. Finally, the extended mind is a notion that primarily came out of work by Dave Chalmers and Andy Clark, two philosophers of mind, um, mm -hmm. that made an argument that um, about the conditions under which we should think about cognition as being only in the head and the conditions in which we need to think about cognition as also being in the environment. Okay, And they use examples like uh, me remembering some event or address versus writing it down on some external uh, medium like a notebook and then using that external device in the same way that I would use my internal memory to trigger my behavior to say, get a taxi to a certain location at a certain time. Um, in one sense, I think the notion of extended mind is really just the brain body environment systems notion that you need to take what's going on in the environment on equal on an equal setting. But there's another sense in which I personally find the extended mind a little worrisome because I think it buys into a a pattern of speech, which I think is inaccurate. And that is that the mind is something that has a physical location. Okay. I think of the mind as, as a process, right? And its components can have physical locations. And in that sense, in the brain body environment sense, yes, the mind is distributed across components in the nervous system, the body and the environment. But if you want to localize it, in any way. I think it's as wrong to say the mind or cognition can be in the environment as it is to say that it that it's in the head. I think instead that it's just distributed across the brain body environment system in ways that it's science's job to understand which components are in which location, if you will, and how do the interaction between those components um, generate the, the the processes that we think of as cognitive, okay? And I think arguing about the location of mind, except insofar as we accept its distribution across the system is just misleading and gets us into to little um, tangents that are not productive. So I, to summarize, um, I think 4E cognition really does fit into the sort of brain body environment perspective I've been talking about. But as with everything I've been I've been saying, the answer is a little more complicated than that because there are different traditions and histories and perspectives that that hide under those seemingly simple words like extended that really need to be brought into the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to follow up to that, because at a certain point when you mentioned there, uh, perhaps some discussion surrounding where the mind is situated when you were mentioning the extended bit of the 4E cognition. Yes. Um, I mean, when it comes to the environment, we are also including here the social environment, correct? Because there are parts of cognition, human cognition, for example, but I would imagine that would also apply to other animals that can only be properly understood if... Um, embedded in a particular social environment. Yeah. The, the, so the way I would say it is my environment includes other agents right. and the interactions that I engage with, uh, that I engage in with those other agents is this social environment that you're mm -hmm. talking about. So yes, it is, but I don't view it as like a different environment. It's right. It's there by virtue of the fact that I'm not the only living system in the universe. There are mm -hmm. other organisms, there are other 
human beings and therefore my environment includes such systems and, and my interactions with my environment include interactions with such systems. And, and our pattern of interaction has its own character, uh, which is different from my pattern of interaction with a pen or something, right? So mm -hmm. it's all on an equal footing to me. But but yes, that those would be included by virtue of the fact that there are other agents in my environment. Mm -hmm. And related to the notion of embeddedness and also environmental feedback, how is it that multiple behaviors can be driven from the same neural circuit? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. And it's a, it's a beautiful example of a question that you would approach very differently if you take a very brain-centric perspective versus mm -hmm. if you take a brain-body-environment perspective. So if you take a brain centered perspective, you'd be looking for some sort of switching mechanism in the nervous system. Maybe there'd be some network, some executive network of neurons that uh, biases other networks so that some get activated and then some get deactivated or something like that. Um, but then you run into the problem of what switches the switcher. I mean, ultimately, you know, where is this coming from? And then you get into, unfortunately, think discussions of consciousness and free will and all this stuff. I look at it very, very differently. Um, neural dynamics, by virtue of its sort of nonlinear character, can can go down. If you, imagine you took a snapshot of the state of my brain, whatever that would mean. What not just neural firing, but maybe chemical things, whatever that means, and however unrealistic it would be to do. You take a snapshot right now, okay? That's a single state. And if if you if you imagine uh, unrealistically that I'm completely disconnected from a body and the environment, so I'm in the brain and the vat, right? that single state would evolve in some particular way over time just by virtue of the neuronal interactions only. There's nothing else coming in, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. That evolution would be uniquely determined by the current state. If you take a sort of physicalist perspective, mm -hmm. there's not some, you know, other thing that's inter that's, that's, uh, that's supervening on the physics. That would, it would just unfold in one way, right. okay? So in that sense, there's no change in behavior that would be possible in such an isolated system. Now, there may be things that we would externally interpret as a change in behavior because my brain dynamics uh, changes over many time scales. So for a while, I may be doing one thing, like, I don't know, snapping my fingers. And then eventually, because of slower time scale changes, I may habituate to that sensory feedback and sort of shift to another mode, okay, where I, I don't know, okay. sleep or something. Now, you can't even sleep exactly because there's no body there anymore. But but at any rate, the, the, the thing is, it's one state unfolding along one trajectory that we might partition into different behaviors based on some property of that state trajectory, okay? In contrast, and so that's the way we, that this, neurocentric way has to think about multiple behaviors is that there's some something about that trajectory that goes one way for a while and then goes another way for a while and, and occupies these different behavioral subsets. Okay. The moment you have a body in the environment, all of that's still going on. It's not like the brain becomes a, an input output device. You still got all the brain dynamics, but it's constantly being shaped and perturbed and modulated by what's going on in the body and what's going on in the environment. Okay. So the way I think of that is rather than the, the brain following its single sort of unique trajectory given its current state, the trajectory it follows depends on its own state and dynamics, but also the shaping that it receives from the body and the environment. And that can trigger changes in behavior as well. Um, as I get hungrier and hungrier as the day progresses, that's my, my gut sensors, if you will, are changing inputs to my peripheral nervous system, which is interconnected with and interacting with other aspects of my nervous system. And that can trigger changes in behaviors. I don't have to internally just suddenly say, oh, time to eat, because my dynamics reached a certain point, the body can trigger those things. Likewise, the environment, you know, if I'm in a, if I'm an animal in a situation where uh, I'm very hungry and there's some there's some prey or food available, then that's going to affect the way my behavior unfolds. If suddenly a predator comes into the picture, then that's going to change change the whole 
the whole thing. So I think about behaviors, uh, the neural basis of behavior, the neural component of behavior in this way. There's all this latent dynamics in the brain that is waiting to be evoked by particular uh, external dynamics. But if you don't have that external dynamics, the brain's just gonna be following whatever its unique trajectory is. But when you put it in the context of a body and environment, then those different latent dynamics can be evoked under different situations. And then the question becomes not how does the brain switch between one mode and another, but rather what are the latent dynamics of a nervous system and how do various patterns of external perturbation and interaction evoke those different those different patterns? Mm -hmm. So uh, just before we get into minimally cognitive agents and then the last part of our interview where I would like to ask you a little bit more about evo-devo approaches in mm -hmm. biology and all of that, uh, we've been talking about dynamical systems theory a bit, but there's also another kind of theory that I don't think we have touched on yet, at least explicitly, that is information theory. So could you tell us about information theory, what it is, and then if we can, if it's possible for us to combine uh, information theory and dynamical systems theory as sort of two different styles of explanation in cognitive science? Yeah, sure. So information theory uh, comes out of work by Claude Shannon, um, who was concerned about reliability of communication channels. Uh, he worked for a research arm uh, of the phone company um, 70 some years ago, I guess. Uh, and they were concerned about the reliability of communication. And he came up with a mathematical framework, which is now called information theory, for trying to quantify uh, how much information a particular channel, as he called it, because he's thinking about a, line, a telephone line, how much information a particular channel has about some source. Okay. This has been uh, co-opted, much to his chagrin to some extent, um, to be applied to basically, whenever you have a random variable, that is, I can make some measurement about some quantity in the world, and it's, it's, it's partly random because I'm just going to measure it over and over again or going to measure it in different um, contexts and I get some distribution of values. Um, and maybe I have, I'm just going to talk about one aspect of, of information theory. Maybe I have another random variable that I also make a bunch of measurements of and I get some distribution. One of the interesting questions that information theory tries to, at, to answer is to what extent does that second random variable carry information about the first van random variable, by which I mean, if I measure the second random variable only, how much can I predict about the result of subsequently measuring the first random variable? Okay, mm -hmm. So said that way, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with meaning or semantics or, you know, any of the notions that we often talk about information in, uh, in cognitive science, but it's become a really useful tool for studying uh, complicated systems. And it's very complementary to say a dynamical systems perspective because information theory is purely observational. It's purely statistical. You don't need to have an underlying model of how the system is actually working the way you do in dynamical systems theory. On the other hand, what information theory can tell you about a system is therefore limited. So if I say that measuring that second variable carries a certain amount of information about the first variable, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's some causal link between the two. All information theory can do is quantify correlations between things. It could be suggestive of a causal link, but to discover that causal link, you have to dig deeper. Uh, you have to actually perturb the system and look at the effects, or you have to actually get down into the underlying dynamical mechanisms of the system and show that, for example, if my two systems are neurons and one of them seems to carry information about the other, that there's actually a synaptic connection or a synaptic pathway between them. All of that's outside the purview of information theory. But information theory can be, because it's a statistical theory, can be applied to systems for which you have no hope of completely working out the underlying detailed mechanisms. So that's the answer to your first question very briefly. That's kind of what information theory is about. Mm -hmm. 
It's about sort of correlations between distributions of random variables. Mm -hmm. uh, and to answer your second question, I first want to point out that the way I look at this is just another entry in my toolbox. So there's formal theory of computation, there's dynamical systems theory, there's information theory, there's probabilistic approaches. Um, you know, I, these are all mathematical uh, bodies of work. They're mathematical tools, or the way I like to think about them as they're mathematical lenses through which I can look at a complicated system, okay? Mm -hmm. So I can try to explain the brain dynamically, computationally, information theoretically, uh, using sort of Bayesian reasoning, probabilistic reasoning, all of those things are lenses. And it's not that, and this is, goes back to why I think a dynamical hypothesis or a computational hypothesis is, isn't meaningful, because there is no fact of the matter that a system is computational, it is informational, it is, um, it is dynamical, and so on. It's a question of if I look at the system through this lens, does it buy me something? Is it helpful? Does it does it help me formulate my theory of what's going on? And so uh, the particular work that you're talking about was an attempt to show that in a simple model. So what we did was we looked at a particular model agent that we had produced, and we analyzed it in, in fair amount of detail through the lens of dynamical systems theory and came up with a story about what was going on. And then we kind of set that aside and took the lens of information theory. And uh, we tried to forget about the dynamical analysis and just say, as an information theorist, what would I measure? What would I calculate? What would the story look like? And then we basically showed how these two separate or different stories of the same agent were both complementary. Uh, I mean, let me put it this way. They weren't inconsistent, but they were also weren't redundant, okay? Mm -hmm. They were complementary in that the parts where they overlapped were consistent, but they emphasized certain different aspects of the story and different, um, they had different strengths and weaknesses. And so the, the point of the work was to, was to have a concrete example to make the argument that we shouldn't have debates about dynamical, hypothesis, computational hypothesis, information hypothesis, we should rather take this whole toolbox and use it uh, as best we can uh, to try to understand a complicated system. That doesn't mean that every tool is equally useful for every system, okay? I'm not saying all tools are created equal. It's just like, you know, you can use a, a screwdriver as a hammer, but it doesn't work very well. You're better off using a hammer under certain situations. You can also use a hammer as a screwdriver. If you've got the part that pulls the nails out, the tines can sometimes be used to, to loosen or tighten a screw, but it's better to have both in your toolbox and to use the which tool works best for which job. And the same thing I think is true of these mathematical tools. So uh, now about minimally cognitive agents. So what is the minimal cognition research program about? And what are you trying to learn or understand through it? So again, I have to make a distinction. Um, when people use the term minimal cognition these days, they typically are referring to uh, what are the minimal capacities that a system must exhibit in order to be considered cognitive? Okay. Okay. And that gets into a discussion point we had earlier about the, the idea is that cog cognitive behavior is some special subset of behavior that only humans and maybe some higher primates and things can actually exhibit. And so the minimal cognition program then depends on where you make your cut. Okay, if it's conversing in natural language with a human being, then that's a pretty high level of system that you have to have in order to uh, consider it to be cognitive. If it's just deploying memory in a advantageous way, for example, then there are, you know, single celled organisms can do that. Plants can do that in certain situations. Not surprisingly, based on what I said earlier, I don't like to think about it that way. I like to, like Maturana Varela to think about Every living system behaves. It's just that the behavioral capacities are more or less complicated than some other behavioral capacity. 
And so when I talk about the minimally cognitive behavior, which was the term that I introduced in 1996, I don't mean minimal cognition in that sense. Okay. Rather, minimally cognitive behavior came out of basically the research program I've been following. So it's got more of a historical um, origin. Uh, mm -hmm. I started, as you pointed out, with sort of what are considered motor or low-level sensory motor behaviors, things like locomotion, chemotaxis, and so on. And I started developing my own particular take on this brain-body environment system perspective in those terms. But when I presented that work to cognitive sciences people or to AI people, uh, I consistently got the criticism, well, yes, all of that makes sense for simple animals, but it doesn't apply to human beings. It doesn't apply to, to cognition, again, interpreted to mean this very high level kind of behavioral capacity. Uh, in particular, uh, Andy Clark and a co-author wrote a paper um, that criticized some of my work and also work by Rod Brooks and Tim Van Gelder. I don't know if I've mentioned Tim yet, but he was the one who, yeah, I did. He's the one who, produ who produced this uh, dynamical hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And yes. Andy Clark and his co-author uh, in this paper argued that the problem was that none of us were actually tackling what they called representation hungry behaviors. Uh, we were fixated on two simple kinds of behaviors that we really needed to tackle much more complicated ones. And uh, I didn't think that was true in the sense that I didn't think the story that I was developing would change, but it became clear that in order to convince anyone, I actually had to demonstrate that. And mm -hmm. so the idea was to come up with simple agents that did things simple model agents that did things that would be much harder for a um, cognitive scientist to just reject out of hand. Well, locomotion isn't cognition. Okay, that's easy to say, but I wanted to come up with things that, examples that they wouldn't be so able to uh, reject. And I called, so I think of this as just behaviors of a certain level of sophistication that they couldn't reject them out of hand. So I thought of these as as, uh, I was interested in cognitive behaviors, and I wanted the simplest examples of such things. So I wasn't making a claim about what's the minimal capacities necessary uh, to define cognition. Rather, I was interested in exploring what's the minimal behavioral capacities that would get a room full of cognitive scientists interested in what you had to say. Does that, that distinction make sense? It, yes, it does. So, so I started uh, building brain-body environment models. So the same kind of thing I was doing with the artificial insect, dynamical nervous systems, virtual bodies embedded in virtual environments, but doing things like um, visually classifying objects or uh, exhibiting selective attention in the face of multiple objects in the environment at the same time, reaching out and grabbing an object, um, categorizing objects based on not their individual properties, but their relations to other objects. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, things like uh, simple communication between agents. Okay, So these are all tasks that I looked at, and my students and collaborators and I over time, and, and others that, that sort of picked up this as well, uh, were able to show you can apply the same uh, approaches. We haven't talked about the approach that I used to actually produce these agents, but the same approaches can be applied for these more cognitive-like tasks. Um, and the same notions of analysis can be applied to the, the resulting brain-body environment systems, although it obviously becomes more complicated, which is why in the end, I think it was a good thing to do because it starts to press the tools a little bit. And for example, one of the reasons I got interested in information theory was the dynamical explanations I was starting to build of some of these more sophisticated uh, behavioral capacities were getting very, very complicated. And I was looking for other tools, You know, thinking a screwdriver might be helpful here rather than just a hammer. I was looking for other tools that might give me complementary insights. Okay, So when I say minimally cognitive behavior, Personally, I'm talking about that methodology of picking uh, behavioral capacities that cognitive scientists claim to be interested in and showing, uh, exhibiting them in simpler agents that we can analyze using this brain-body environment perspective. Mm -hmm.
Uh, and so earlier when I asked you about the historical background uh, behind the situated, dynamical and embodied framework in cognitive science, you mentioned there that you come uh, primarily from a computer science and AI perspective. So do the approaches to cognitive science that we've been talking about here also apply to AI systems? Uh, yes, I do. Um, but I want to emphasize that I do not consider myself an AI researcher at this mm -hmm. point. That was where I okay. came from. But when I got yeah. interested enough in the biological questions and the cognitive science questions, um, I stopped being focused on building devices, building programs that can exhibit these things, and rather became focused on trying to understand how they work uh, okay. in the natural world, right? Mm -hmm. So, but having said that, I, I mean, if I force myself to put my AI hat or my robotics hat back on for a moment, uh, I would think that uh, a good argument could be made that you're much better off trying to uh, follow the one path we know that to intelligence that works rather than trying to uh, build it from scratch on, on our own. And I guess the analogy I would make there was to flight. Um, flight's actually an interesting, the history of the development of flying machines is it's, it's very interesting and full of lessons for what we're talking about. But I just want to point out one. And that is that um, the very notion of flight, of course, came from seeing it in animals. That's how people first even thought of flight as a thing to aspire toward. Right. And all of the initial approaches to flying machines tried to copy animals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, as we know, that didn't work very well. But the mm -hmm. reason it didn't work very well is interesting. It's not because looking to animals was a mistake. It's because we didn't really understand what aspects of those animals were important. So we see birds have feathers. So if we put feathers on our machines, they, does that make them fly? Well, no, because... Feathers themselves don't intrinsically fly. It's the way they're deployed by a bird to generate lift. And eventually, uh, in thinking about what it is about animals that produces flight, and when we try to copy some aspects of those things into our machines, the which, which ones were more, more successful, you start to uncover principles like Bernoulli's principles, to take one, for example, which generates lift in fixed wing aircraft, that you start to understand what is it about animals that made flight possible, and therefore what is it that we need to copy um, in our attempt to engineer flying machines. There's one other part of the lesson that I think is worth pointing, pointing out, though. In doing that, uh, an engineer might argue that in the end, we don't really need the animals. We, we were able to produce machines that can fly, and that's very true. Um, on the other hand, uh, I'd like to see someone build an airplane that can take off from and land on a tree branch. Okay. So it depends on what your problem actually is. And the problem for the engineers was to transport people, originally just one, but eventually lots of them packed into a, into a can of sardines, basically, um, long distances. And that's not something that birds do. That's not, that's not a goal of natural flight. So once we got to the point where we started to understand the principles of flight, we could repurpose them to solve engineering problems. And then it's true, the way those engineering problems are solved may not be usefully inspired by the biology unless there's some other biology that might be appropriate for that engineering problem. So I, I guess if I could summarize all my answers in this, in this interview, it, it's, it's complicated. Right. I think there's a lot to be gained from paying careful attention to the natural world, but we also don't want to we don't want it to reduce to just mere mimicry. We have to understand how the problems we as engineers are trying to solve are similar to, but also differ from the problems that uh, organisms are trying to solve, and adjust our inspiration accordingly. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, there's one last topic I would like to get into today that has sure. to do with evil-devil approaches in biology and also 
uh, moving beyond the modern evolutionary synthesis. I guess we could mention here, as uh, some people have been calling it, the extended evolutionary synthesis. So uh, about Evo Devo, could you tell us what is developmental bias and perhaps if it can influence the direction of evolutionary modification and if so, uh, in what ways? Sure. Um, I am not a an evolutionary or developmental biologist, so I want to preface my answer to your question with, again, a brief historical comment about how I got into those issues, because it does tie very directly mm -hmm. into the things we've been talking about, even though that's not obvious on first blush. So I've, I've referred a few times to the methodology that I use to produce these model agents, and I think it's worth briefly explaining that, because that's where my interest in this comes from. So we can build model nervous systems, model bodies, and model environments and put them all together. But we have a problem of if I just throw a bunch of stuff together randomly, it doesn't do any interesting behavior. Clearly, we want brain body environment models that actually produce some interesting behavior like walking or selective attention or, or something like that. And I took two approaches approaches to that. In my dissertation, which led to the artificial insect, what I did was try to take all the information I could find about actual insects and their nervous systems. I, I still had to fill in a lot, but I tried to model it as much as possible and what was known about a variety of natural animals. But I very quickly found that the level of detail that you need to actually build a model is vastly outstrips the level of knowledge that you can find in the biological literature. You know, uh, to be direct about it, you need numbers. You need parameter values for every connection and every intrinsic property of a neuron and masses and lengths and all kinds of things that first of all only makes sense if you're trying to model a specific animal like C. elegans. And secondly, varies, as I mentioned earlier, from animal to animal. And thirdly, isn't really known to that level of detail for any animal if you want the total set of parameters, essentially. So after my dissertation, I switched to a different approach, which was if I can't directly model biological organisms, maybe I can model the process by which biological organisms achieve the capabilities that they have, namely evolution. And so the approach that we use is we evolve these model agents using something called evolutionary algorithms, which is kind of a computer science-y abstraction and simplification of biological evolution. And we use that process to evolve model agents that produce walking or that produce selective attention. And that got me very interested, you know, because that works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes, it's very complicated and computationally expensive. How does it work in biology that, that we kind of reliably get such sophisticated and well-adapted organisms. And that got me into thinking about more about evolution in biology, uh, just like my interests in uh, building complete agents got me interested in neurobiology and, and e ethology, the study of animal behavior. So that got me into think learning more about evolution. And one of the things that you know, but you don't really appreciate until you get into it, is that it's not just evolution, it's development, right? Uh, genes are modified during reproduction, but textbook, you know, high school textbooks aside, genes do not directly code for behavioral traits. Genes, strictly speaking, code for proteins. And right. it's through a very complicated process of development which is itself a very spatially and temporally complicated dynamical process that organisms grow. And a change of a gene in general, there are exceptions, but for the most part, changing a gene in general played through that whole developmental process can have quite non-trivial and unexpected consequences in the final organism. When I do evolutionary algorithms, the standard abstraction is you've got a set of parameters on your genome. And, you know, if I change that parameter by, say, a mutation, then the corresponding interconnection strength between two neurons is going to change. Okay, But actual development doesn't work that way. And that's both a negative and a positive. It's a negative because it means it makes it another whole very complicated process that we need to understand. Um, but it's a positive in that 
unlike when I do it, where I'm randomly searching essentially the space of, say, neural circuits, um, development is not randomly searching a space. Even if you imagine that genes are being randomly changed, say, in a uniform random way, that's not true by... Uh, by the way, but let's assume that, that, that each gene is equally likely to mutate by an equal amount, okay? The resulting organism does not look like a uniform random distribution of organisms at all. The developmental process itself induces a very strong bias on a uniform random sampling process to produce a uh, an organism. And if that bias itself has evolved, which it has, developmental systems themselves has evolved, then one would imagine that that bias can, can buffer a lot of genetic variability into potentially useful variations in the final organism, which means you can't just ignore it. You need to actually understand it. And so that was my process, my history of coming to a literature on Evo Devo, as it's called, which tries to combine thinking about evolutionary processes with thinking about development. I guess the other half of that is there's a whole branch of developmental biology that doesn't tend to think about evolution, or if it does, it's in very kind of vague, flowery ways. Um, so the point of Evo Devo is to put these two things together and really understand how evolution changes developmental systems and how development shapes the the progeny that you get, which in turn uh, provides the population that you can select from. Natural selection only selects. It can only select from the population that's produced, and that's produced by development. And so your particular point about developmental bias then is that one of the, the uh, topics in Evo Devo that my student and I got really interested in was, okay, it's one thing to say, it seems kind of obvious to me in hindsight, that development shapes evolution by virtue of shaping how the adult organism depends upon the genetic encoding. Okay. But nobody has ever been able to actually quantify or characterize that developmental bias in a system. And <clears throat> using my sort of standard research methodology of, of building toy models to try to explore concepts, I said, you know, we could do that in a toy model. So a student and I actually built a little, it was a neural developmental model. Okay, so the genes coded for things like um, uh, cell adhesion proteins that, that make mm -hmm. cells stick together and axon growth markers and things like that. So we had a simple little model of neural development. I wouldn't I wouldn't justify it as being incredibly accurate, but neither was it completely made up. It was grounded in some aspects of neural development. And then we looked at um, evolving that model to produce a circuit, a neural circuit with a given architecture. So this was no body, no environment. We were just looking at neural development here. And what we did was, okay, here's our neural developmental model. It's not, it's nothing special, but it is a neural developmental model. Let's characterize bias. So we did huge numerical samples of a, of a, of a massive number of different gene combinations. And we looked at what circuits would develop for each of those. And you build histograms, what circuits most commonly developed, what circuits uh, never developed, and so on. And we we developed a certain way of looking at that statistically, which, which we proposed. Here is a way to cash out the verbal notion of developmental bias in a quantitative manner. We've only applied it to this toy model developmental system, but here's a way to think about developmental bias as a real thing. But then we went beyond that. And, and again, I, I, I'm going to wrap, wrap this up here, but there's more things you can do. Once you've shown that there is developmental bias, you can actually look at why, where does it come from? What, what decisions in our developmental model lead to this kind of a bias or that kind of a bias? So, so we were able to explore that. And now you're looking not just at one developmental model, but at a, sort of a space of developmental models and how their bias changes as you slightly change the developmental model. And then finally, what we could, what we did was actually put this, this new understanding of developmental bias back into the evolutionary algorithm and look at how that interplay between selection and developmental bias actually drove the pathways of, of evolution. 
So my last question will be then, so I mentioned earlier the extended evolutionary synthesis. Uh, do you agree with people who propose to extend the evolutionary synthesis to include, of course, some phenomena coming from developmental biology and other people also talk about things like uh, culture, language, symbolism, and other factors like that that m might shape the sometimes the direction of evolution and other times how a particular organism develops uh, beyond, let's say, a gene-centric view of evolutionary biology? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is, is yes, I absolutely do. Um, a slightly longer answer is it's very much like um, my reasoning with the brain-body environment systems. Mm -hmm. Let's start with genes, okay? You have genes. You go through uh, transcription and protein synthesis and development, and obviously there's also growth and, you know, maturation, but I'm going to forget about that. Outcomes, let's say, in adult organisms. I'm already simplifying things, but so we have genes to adult organisms. Now, that phenotype, first of all, the genes aren't subject to selection. It's only properties of the organism that are subject to selection. But it's not like once you reach adulthood, uh, some, some great evaluator in the sky comes down and stamps a number on your forehead that says your fitness is 17.3. OK, what happens is you live a life in an environment uh, interacting with other individuals. Let's say that life ends up uh, not leaving any progeny. Then no evolution took place along your particular lineage. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you reproduce, then those in, now you now you're back here, right? Those individuals receive a complement of genes that themselves will be transcribed and, and expressed and developed and, and they will live a life. And it's only through that whole process of transcription, development, living, which includes culture um, and so on, that you're being evaluated. So, so the engine, I think, of selection, as I said earlier, doesn't work unless you actually produce organisms and with variation. And those produced organisms depend upon that whole intervening process between genetic transcription and reproduction. So anything that appears along that long line of the life of an individual has to play a role. It affects the, the reproductive viability of the individual, which ultimately is what feeds back into the genetic level to produce evolution. So I, I just don't see, just like, I mean, the same, the analogy with brain body environment systems is um, you can think wonderfully in deep thoughts, but if they're never actually expressed in behavior and have an impact on others around you in the environment, they're never going to be subject to selection. And therefore they never, they never have any, any impact, right? It's, so you, it, it, they never affect subsequent things. So it's this kind of reasoning that that makes you close these loops, but take take seriously everything that occurs along that loop, including the brain and, and, and the body and the environment in the former case, and including all development and and culture and, and your life uh, in this latter case. So it's very much, I think, the same uh, the same approach, the same formulation, the same way of thinking about it, just applied now in an evolutionary context. Genes play an important role, just like nervous systems play an important role. It's not that they're immaterial, but they're not the end all and be all of this entire uh, loop that powers evolution. Great. So I think this is a good point to wrap our conversation on. Uh, Dr. Beer, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Uh, sure. I, I don't have the URL in front of me. So um, I have a web page. If you just Google Randall D, D is in dog, beer, uh, that web page will come up. I don't remember the exact URL for it. Um, and there you can find courses I teach, uh, the papers I work with, the, I've done the students I've worked with, and so on. 
Also, uh, my email is rdbeer at indiana.edu if you have questions uh, from this interview or something that you'd like to bounce off of me. Great. So I'll be leaving links to that in the description box thank of you. this interview. And Dr. Beer, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a big pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. It's been great talking with you as well. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, a comment. And if you can, please support me on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in, down in the description box. Just $1 per month would already be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. And I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Lenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londoño Correa, Yannick Puntar, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Beck, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, jo John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Georgius Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilly Jr., Old Erringbun, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zuel, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Ben Zuliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowleys, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, BR, and Masood Ali Mohammadi. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Franks, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Ugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Old Nick Ortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codrian, Bogdan Canivets and Vege G. Thank you for all.